All right. So hi, everyone. Let's just wait for a few more people uh, to arrive before we get started. So in the meantime, let's share the screen so everyone can see. Right, so computer is so slow. I really need a better one. Ah, here we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, today, we begin our discussion of the uncanny, which, as I mentioned last time, uh, is an interesting opportunity. Uh, for us to uh, discuss some of the, I guess, sort of affective uh, responses that occur with um, not just uncanny uh, situations or persons, but uh, paranormal or anomalous ones. And also it gives us an opportunity to talk about animism and animacy. And I think that these are uh, a couple of key, I guess, I don't know what I would call them, a couple of tendencies um, that humans have, which uh, I think in a, in a majority of cases can explain uh, not just how we feel when we are confronted with something anomalous, but also why we might think an anomalous occurrence is a paranormal occurrence. Right. And I hope to clarify this as we go. I mean, uh, as I kind of kick kick off uh, here in this lecture, the uncanny, the uncanny is not really a word we use uh, very often. The uncanny is not really something that we talk about all that often in everyday vernacular. Right. So anyway, um, what I've decided to do here is basically sort of do a slow version um, of a conference presentation that I did. Oh, when was it now? I can't remember if it was earlier this year or last year. Anyway, it was a presentation at the Center for Inquiry Canada, which is a uh, skeptical humanist organization. So I got invited to uh, deliver a talk there and I thought, oh, it would be great to it would great, be great to do something on the uncanny because I spent a lot of time uh, working on this stuff in graduate school and in my undergrad as well. So this is kind of like a, a slowed down version of that talk. Um, we may get through all of these slides today. We may not. I'll probably go a little bit faster uh, when it comes to the stuff from Freud and whatnot. And that's because we, uh, we haven't read Freud yet. I only asked you to read Jensch and um, if you could to get started on the Sandman. So uh, that's what we'll do today. Uh, and if we get through it all, great. If we don't, we'll finish next time. Uh, and speaking of next time, I think that what we'll do is just sort of discuss um, what I've talked about today and how that can be brought to bear on paranormal claims, um, uh, claims about paranormal beings, paranormal phenomena. And by the way, if anyone has questions or wants to make a comment, 
just feel free to uh, raise your hand or jump in or send a little message into the chat, right? So, Sounds good. awesome. Uh, uh, one other thing that was cool about this, uh, just um, it's not really that pertinent, but, but it was a cool conference. The keynote speaker was um, William B. Davis. And um, in case you're not uh, aware, uh, he's a Canadian actor who played the, um, the smoking man on the X-Files. So that was cool. And they had him there uh, because again, it's, uh, you know, it's the center for inquiry. It's about skepticism, reason, secular humanism, that kind of thing. And even though uh, he played this uh, character on this show that deals with the paranormal, who's, you know, trying to uh, uh, undermine uh, Scully and Mulder all the time and, you know, get, get an alien invasion going. He's actually, uh, in real life, uh, a skeptic uh, who, who, you know, does this thing quite often. So that was kind of cool uh, to hear from uh, like a, a guy who plays uh, a sort of uh, paranormal associated figure on a very famous show uh, is actually in real life an advocate for um, science and skepticism and that kind of thing. So that was pretty neat. So what am I going to try to do today? Well, I'm going to argue that a naturalistic account of the uncanny would make an important contribution uh, to something called anomalistic psychology. We haven't talked about anomalistic psychology yet, but we will. Essentially, all I'll say for now is that anomalistic psychology, and I kind of mentioned this last time, anomalistic psychology does something that parapsychology does not. Parapsychology, and we'll see a bit more after we're done with our discussion on the uncanny parapsychology, uh, often, often seems to um, make claims which violate principles of naturalism, uh, principles of natural science, right? So uh, cause and effect, uh, parsimony, replicability, um, things like this that are important for the natural sciences. Um, anomalistic psychology takes claims about paranormal things and says, okay, um, let's not call them paranormal. Let's call them anomalistic, just in the sense that they're out of the ordinary. And let's try to explain uh, these anomalies using um, the body of scientific knowledge we have, uh, the principles of naturalism that guide science, you know, the scientific method, all of that stuff. And this means that sometimes we may discover something new, uh, but it often means that what we thought was paranormal is either explained away or explained naturalistically. It's naturalized uh, and it's not really paranormal anymore, right? And I think if we do this with the uncanny, if we naturalize the uncanny, which has, um, as you'll see, I think if you've read uh, Yanshin, if you've started to read Hoffman, it has uh, associations with the paranormal and the supernatural. They're not exactly the same thing, but some things that uh, we could describe as paranormal, uh, we would certainly also describe as uncanny. And we'll get to some examples as we go. So the goal here is to adjudicate between French, uh, <laughs> French enjoyed, between Jensch and Freud, who are really the two uh, they're like the two er, uh, early 20th, late 19th, early 20th century thinkers who discuss this. Um, they're kind of the starting point to this day, even in the humanities, if, if you talk about the uncanny outside of a scientific sort of setting, like we are here, um, it's usually just, uh, you know, discussing Jensch or Freud, maybe doing some psycho psychoanalytic stuff which is cool, it's good for the humanities. It's not really what we want to do here though, right? So what I wanna do is adjudicate between these two thinkers and show that aside from some fundamental differences and, and maybe a few superficial differences too, they both seem to agree that perceptions of animacy and mentation play a very big role in experiencing this uh, sort of uncanny sensation. Right. And then I will try, if we get to this today, I'll try and explain um, 
the emotion that accompanies uncanny, uncanny, uncanny experiences. And I think that that is often eeriness. And I will explain that eeriness is a type of anxiety. Um, anxiety is a bit of an interesting emotion. So I'll talk a little bit about what the emotions are and how they work. But anxiety is interesting because emotions uh, usually have what we would call content, right? Emotions are about something. Uh, usually it's very clear what emotions are about, right? Like if you're frightened of something, for example, um, that something you're frightened of is, is the content, right? Say uh, 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 a charging bear or something, right? You, you see this bear charging at you, become frightened. The fear is telling you, hey, there's a dangerous um, thing approaching you. It's that bear over there. So uh, the sort of theme of the emotion, what it represents to you is danger. And its content is, you know, this dangerous bear who seems to be charging you, right? With anxiety, uh, the content is uncertainty. Um, and in the case of eeriness, I think that it's uncertainty over these two uh, characteristics, animacy and mentation. Uh, that is to say whether something is alive or, or not, whether it's animate or not, and whether it has a mind or not. So the uncanny. It's not really an easy word to define. Uh, maybe this is because it's not really a word that occurs all that often in everyday parlance, right? But some uh, synonyms, in case you, you're not familiar with this term, might be weird, strange. Uh, unhomely is definitely one. Uh, eerie. Unhomely is very important because uncanny is real, is uh, is uh, sort of um, it's it's the best translation of a German word, and this is the word that Freud and Jensch use uh, unheimlich, which means unhomely. So etymologically, these words uncanny and unheimlich are different, but semantically they're actually very similar, and we'll see why that is. So you know, strange, uh, unhomely, eerie, uh, creepy, spooky, um, all uh, all might describe something that we would say is uncanny. And often these words are uh, describe, uh, describe um, things that may be supernatural or paranormal as well, right? So, so how do we study this, right? As I mentioned a moment ago, the origins of present day scholarship on this stuff uh, are these two papers. There's Jensch's Psychology of the Uncanny and Sigmund Freud's The Uncanny. Jensch's is a lot shorter. It was published in, uh, huh, published in um, two parts initially. Freud's is a lot longer. And Freud's is uh, uh, available in three parts. Um, the first part, though, is really just uh, sort of iterating over all of these different dictionary definitions to try to define the uncanny so it, it it you can you can skim those parts of it when you go and read it um so these are the these are sort of the foundations and and as i said both of them because they're working uh, they're writing reading speaking german uh you know uh jensch i believe was from germany uh freud was austrian it's important it's important to note you know by nationality he was austrian but in austria they speak German. So he's a German speaker. So if I say German, I mean the language, not the nationality. So uh, they're using das unheimlich, which means the unhomely. Remember that because that'll be important later. Now, a lot of the uh, literature on the uncanny is, as I mentioned a moment ago, found in the humanities. Uh, we're talking literature, we're talking poetry. Uh, film studies, you know, any any sort of like um, critique of different kinds of art, even architecture. So visual art, architecture, literature, poems, all kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> Freud is also uh, discussed quite widely in like think areas like feminism and queer theory. Uh, cultural studies is another one. I mean, there's all kinds of areas in the humanities. Um, 
where you can talk about the uncanny. It's great. Um, but as far as the sciences go, there's not a whole lot there. There is uh, a sort of niche area in the cognitive sciences and robotics, and this concerns explaining something called the uncanny valley phenomenon, which you've probably heard of, right? Um, has anyone, uh, I'm sure someone's familiar with the uncanny valley, but would anyone like to take a stab at uh, explaining it for us or explaining what it is rather? Uh, Dahlia, go ahead. I, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's like the threshold at which something looks too human or something like that. Yeah. So it's not quite human, so it's off, um, and it's really creepy. Yes, exactly. Um, it was a hypothesized relationship between um, familiarity and human likeness. Familiarity isn't really the best word. Now we'll use um, words like affinity or, or something like that, or and there's any number of words we can use, but familiarity isn't really the best term. But you're right. Uh, it was uh, conceived of by a Japanese roboticist named Masahiro Mori, who was working with artificial limbs. He would design, um, for example, artificial hands uh, for, for amputees to use, which had like myoelectric sensors and could maybe like uh, be controlled uh, with, uh, by signaling the muscles here. And this was all in the 70s, uh, the 60s and 70s. So this was pretty advanced stuff at the time. And Maury noticed that um, the more realistic the limbs looked or the more realistic they tried to make them look, the uh, weirder they seemed. And he extrapolated from this. He said, well, imagine if we made a whole entire robot that was human-like with hair and artificial skin, that would look very uncanny. So it's important to note that at the time this was proposed, there was no robot uh that looked uncanny like this that fell into the uncanny valley there were automata which are a bit different than robots and i'll explain those in a little while but uh it wasn't until uh really uh computer animation became big you know pixar films and that stuff it wasn't until this time that discussion of the uncanny valley really entered uh sort of like popular discourse or even academic discourse this paper kind of sat just in obscurity for like 40 years before people uh got into it so nowadays uh will there are a lot of studies that try to investigate the psychology of the uncanny valley phenomenon but what they don't do is try to understand just what the uncanny is in general. So beyond just the pair, uh, the paranormal anomalistic stuff, um, this would also, I think, be useful for researchers in this area. Um, in any case, as I said, neither of these lines of research tries to understand, uh, you know, the, the psychology of the uncanny as such. So that's why I'd like to do that now. <laughs> um, so why should we do this? Well, not only for the reasons I said, uh, you know, it'll, it'll help make uh, research on the uncanny valley phenomenon easier. It could provide us with insights, um, uh, you know, to sort of a reinvigorate discussion of the uncanny in humanities. Uh, but I think more importantly for our purposes, it would, um, it would really be an, uh, a good contribution uh, to anomalistic psychology, right? And that's because anomalistic psychology I think is the right, it's the right way to replace parapsychology uh, because parapsychology is uh, pseudoscientific, right? It, I don't think it was when it got started, but it certainly is now. Um, now, as I mentioned last time, parapsychology began at Duke University in the 1930s. Joseph Banks and Louisa Rhine founded their parapsychology lab there. And you'll remember that they um, you'll remember that they tried to avoid some of the pitfalls of uh, psychical research. Um, so psychical researchers would 
seek out uh, people who claimed to be spirit mediums and maybe try and do some experiments with them, whereas the Rhines used regular people. And, and they worked with Zenner cards and, and all of that stuff we talked about last time, right, to, to study um, uh, ESP. Um, also ran uh, dice throws for uh, studying PK. So uh, this grew out of the earlier tradition uh, of psychical research, but it's, it's largely been discredited today. There are... There are some parapsychology labs that still exist, but almost none of them are associated with universities because um, universities don't want to fund research on, um, you know, uh, nonsense. <laughs> so, um, and I'm not trying to be dismissive of paranormal claims there. I I'm, I'm dismissive of, of, of the sort of stubbornness of parapsychology, right? It just won't go away, even though we, we know that there are some pretty substantial problems with it. So one of these parapsychology labs is the Rhine Research Center. Um, did anyone have a chance to watch the video I shared of the uh, uh, two researchers at the Rhine Research Center uh, doing the Zener card thing? I shared it in the Discord server. If not, no big deal, but you definitely should take a look. It's, um, they're doing the same stuff that the Rhines were doing back in the day. And we already know that uh, Rhines' uh, results, his, his identification of a hit rate of 7.1 was a big deal at the time. It, it hasn't been replicated. Um, and I guess there's nothing wrong with continuing to try and replicate it. It's just, it hasn't been replicated um, and some parapsychology labs are still trying. There's also the Institute uh, uh, for Noetic Sciences. This is, uh, I think, Dean Radden's research institute. And it's, it's basically just a parapsychology lab. So there are, um, it refuses to go away, we could say. I think we should replace it with anomalistic psychology, which we'll kind of talk about in detail toward the end of the course. But as I mentioned before, it studies anomalistic psychological states. Hmm. Oh, excuse me. The term was coined by an anthropologist named Robert Westcott. Um, and it's been picked up by a number of scholars, including Jones and Zisne, whose paper that we will, uh, we will read later in class. I mean, uh, in, throughout history, uh, this is, I mean, no wonder an anthropologist came up with this term, right? Uh, he, 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 uh, Westcott was aware that throughout history, uh, people have experienced many different kinds of abnormal states, right? Jones and Zisne uh, list some of those states, uh, precognitive dreams, cases of miraculous healings, sleepwalking, uh, and automatic behaviors, as well as cases of severe psychopathology. So uh, at one time or another, these would have been quite anomalous. Imagine uh, having something like a hallucination, for example, before we understood what hallucinations are and the mechanisms that cause them. Well, we would have thought uh, perhaps that it's some kind of supernatural or paranormal being trying to communicate with us maybe, right? I mean, after all, uh, we see this in, in lots of societies around the world um, where uh, uh, pharma pharmacological agents are consumed to uh, communicate with the gods or something, right? So uh, in, in, um, in, uh, in South America, for example, there's the traditional use of ayahuasca, right? And, and there... Uh, people have a misconception about this. You know, there's, there's like ayahuasca tours now where you go to South America and drink the stuff yourself. Traditionally, that's actually not how it works. Traditionally, the, uh, your spiritual leader uh, takes the drugs and has a vision and, and tells you what happened and interprets it for you, right? But it, nonetheless, that's just one example uh, before we knew about neuroscience and pharmacology, something like that would have seemed uh, quite supernatural. Same with dreams, 
Same with illnesses such as schizophrenia or epilepsy, right? So uh, we used to ascribe a supernatural uh, cause to lots of these demons and spirits and so forth. Uh, but of course, now we know that these are abnormal psychological states. But there are other kinds of abnormality. Uh, they're anomalous in a different way, right? They violate our principles of how nature, space, time, cause and effect works, the limiting principles of naturalism. We can have experiences that seem to violate these. You, you may have had such an experience uh, in a, that you've interpreted to be sort of scary, frightening, supernatural. Um, I, 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 I think that... Um, one example for me would be uh, going to a magic show, right? I went and saw uh, many, many years ago now, I saw Penn and Teller perform live. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's all tricks, but there's one trick they did where uh, Teller, the short one, is um, producing coins you know uh he's got two bowls of water a, a guest on uh there's a there's a guest on stage holding a small bowl of water like a goldfish bowl and he's reaching in and then producing coins and dropping them into a larger tank of water and i'm like oh cool you know like yeah coin where's he where's he uh where's he stashing those coins you know that's some pretty good sleight of hand and then the last thing he did was reach into the water uh, appear to take out a whole bunch of coins, drop them in the larger tank, and all of a sudden they became goldfish. And uh, I was like, uh, whoa, uh, I know it's just trickery, but where the heck did those goldfish come from? You know, like, I, I know that they did not appear from nowhere, but it sure looked like they did. And that was, uh, you know, that's like a lip, that's, that seems to violate a limiting principle of naturalism, right? And in a paranormal context, of course, if you're talking about, you know, maybe you visited an old, dark, drafty house that's rumored to be haunted and you, uh, you know, you have some kind of uh, anomalous experience there, uh, you'll probably attribute it to something paranormal or supernatural if you are so inclined. Um, and you'll probably feel a bit, you know, feel very eerie, too. So... Anomalistic psychology tries to be a bit more neutral than parapsychology. Uh, anomalistic psychology doesn't assume a paranormal or supernatural explanation. It assumes a natural one and then tries to explain how uh, the, the event or thing or whatever in question seemed to violate the principles of naturalism. Right. So according to Jones and Zisne, anomalistic psychology is concerned with claims that certain psychological phenomena are inexplicable in terms of orthodox science. So parapsychology, uh, parapsychologists will make a claim, say, say about ESP or precognition, and these claims will violate uh, or claims about these phenomena will violate these limiting principles of naturalism. What an anomalistic psychology does, on the other hand, is apply the scientific method. Uh, it uses the principle of falsifiability. Um, this is very important in science. Um, we don't actually try and verify things, right? What we're actually doing, at least we're not, we don't try and verify theories, right? We do observe and, and check things out. Maybe we'll verify whether something is a certain way out there in the world or not. But when it comes to the level of uh, hypotheses and theories, uh, we are not trying to verify. We are uh, actually trying to falsify. We are trying to show uh, that this theory or this hypothesis is actually wrong. And if we fail to do that, that's actually a good thing. Uh, replicability, another important one. Uh, okay, so say I fail to falsify my hypothesis in my experiment, great. But that could still just be due to chance. Maybe the result I got was just some weird fluke, it's just the way the numbers were. Uh, well, in that case, um, we need to try and replicate, right? So that's why replicability is so important. And then the parsimony, parsimony, Occam's razor, right? If you've got two explanations that explain things equally well, 
go with the one that relies on the fewest untested or unwarranted assumptions. Um, so anomalistic psychology uh, assumes that some phenomena which are claimed to be supernatural or paranormal can be explained naturalistically, and that includes as non-phenomena, right? There's nothing happening, in other words. There's, there's just something maybe going on in the mind. Maybe someone was mistaken about what they saw, but you know, there's nothing happening. Now, I think that some of these anomalous phenomena can sometimes be described as uncanny. They can elicit uncanny experiences. And I think that for that reason, anomalous psychology should try and account for the psychology of the uncanny. Or rather, maybe we should try and account for the psychology of the uncanny for anomalistic psychology. So let's try and do that by looking at Freud and Jentsch. So Jentsch writes, without a doubt, this word, uh, Das und Heimlich, appears to express that someone to whom something uncanny happens is not quite at home or at ease in the situation concerned, that the thing is, or at least seems to be foreign to him. In brief, the word suggests that a lack of orientation is bound up with the uncanniness of a thing or incident. So, um, unfamiliar. Uh, a lack of orientation, not quite at home or at ease. Because remember, the word that Jentsch is using literally translates to unhomely, right? It's out of place. And when we're confronted with something that seems uncanny, it, it's because of the sort of lack of familiarity with it, right? It's not at home in the situation concerned. Let's get into the etymology a little bit, right? Because uh, yeah, in, in, in German, we've got unheimlich. In English, we've got uncanny. W what's the etymology of uncanny? Unheimlich is very straightforward. It's just unhomely. But uncanny? What does that mean? Does anyone want to take a stab at it? Daniel, go ahead. I'm guessing it's something like uh, difficult to make sense of, like difficult to understand. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's that's right. Um, the canny part of uncanny uh, is related to an old English um, uh, and also a Scots word uh, that uh, uh, can, which means home. Um, so there are there are there are certain sayings like when we say somebody uh, somebody is very canny, um, we mean that they're clever, they're knowledgeable, right? This guy this guy here, uh, this, this Sam pointing to somebody, I could say this man is a canny ruler, you know, maybe he's a wise um, general or something. That might be a one way that it might have been put back in the day when this word was. Um, uh, when this word was used uh, more often. Uh, there's also, there's also, um, you know, sayings like you're, you're beyond your ken, you know, you're far from home, meaning that you're out of your depth, you're out of your area of expertise, right? And, and that, uh, this uh, ken in Old English and Scots is cognate with the German kenst, right? Which means to know. Right. So even though etymologically these words are different, semantically, they are quite similar. That is uncanny and unheimlich. So um, what does Freud say? Well, where Jens is like, OK, it's unfamiliarity that's the key. Freud says the uncanny is that species of the frightening that goes back to what was once well known and has long been familiar. And this is the uh, big, big giant definition in the humanities of the uncanny that you will run into all the time is, the, is that the uncanny is, is the familiar made unfamiliar. And that's a very Freudian explanation for the uncanny. Um, why or how 
is the familiar made unfamiliar? Well, well, for Freud, it has to do with repression, right? Uh, and that's, the, that's, that's another interesting difference between these two thinkers is that Jentsch does mention uh, pathologies in his essay. Um, he writes that uh, there may be people with, um, he doesn't use these exact words, but there could be uh, people with mental illnesses for whom uh, uncanniness is experienced quite often, uh, maybe owing to the way their illness uh, makes them see the world. But, uh, oh, and he also talks about uh, breakdowns of the senses, which could be due to intoxication or simply to the environment. Like um, he says at one point, there are, are many more chicken-hearted men at night uh, than there are during the day. Why? Well, things are frightening in the dark. You don't know what's out there, right? A lot of people are afraid of the dark. So um, for Jens, uh, there's, there is a pathological side to, to the uncanny, but the uncanny can happen to anybody. Um, anybody can experience it. For Freud, it's all repression and return of the repressed. It's all pathological. If, if something is uncanny to you, that indicates, oh, You've got some repressed uh, stuff there. You better sit down on the couch. We better do some psychoanalysis, right? So Freud is um, different that way. Uh, he's, he emphasizes pathology a lot more, right? Um, because Jensch, they were both physicians. Jensch and Freud were both trained as physicians. Jensch would be like... Um, what, what we would call a GP today, like a general medicine, but he worked in psychology. Freud actually started as a neurologist and then developed psychoanalysis when he encountered patients um, who had mental illness, but uh, he couldn't find anything wrong with the brain. You know, like uh, this, this person here is mentally ill, but he has no head injury. Um, so, so he developed psychoanalysis to try and tackle the the mental illness. Now, Jensch does not try and define what the uncanny is. He says at the outset that he doesn't really want to define the essence of the uncanny. Rather, what he wants to do is try and identify the conditions that have to obtain for someone to experience an uncanny sensation. So he thinks that um, these conditions always involve psychical uncertainty, or what we would call today intellectual or mental uncertainty, or even psychological uncertainty. Last time, of course, I mentioned that uh, uh, psychical um, in the 19th and early 20th century did not mean, um, you know, like psychic, like ESP and stuff. Uh, no, it, it, it just meant mental, uh, because of course, psychical comes from uh, psyche, which comes from the Greek suke, which means your soul, the mind, the soul. So psychical uncertainty, uncertainty within the soul, if you like, if you want to get poetic about it. Now, there are some things uh, that Jensch uh, lists in his paper that can cause a person to experience an uncanny sensation, right? And I've already mentioned a few of them. Breakdowns of the senses. So uh, the breakdown of the senses uh, could be, uh, I suppose, from within, right? Maybe you have some kind of disease or injury that affects your senses, and uh, this may um, this may cause an uncanny sensation, right? Um, one example I, I, I can think of here, which uh, I I talk about. Um, I was talking about this a long, long time ago with Dr. Andy Brooke uh, at, in the philosophy department at Carleton. I was having a conversation with him about this stuff, and he mentioned to me the capgrass delusion, which is a very interesting neurological disorder where um, uh, people form the belief that um, the people they know have been replaced by imposters. And it has something to do with the uh, the feeling of familiarity that, that we experience when we perceive, you know, like our friends and our family, because of damage to the brain, this doesn't occur when we look at those faces. 
so I could look at my partner and think, uh, you know, oh, that looks like my partner, but I don't feel that sense of familiarity with her. So she's an imposter. And that's the Capgrass delusion. That must be quite uncanny. Um, thinking that uh, oh, that person, that's not the person I think they are. They've been replaced. Very strange. That must feel very weird. But of course, breakdowns of the senses can also include uh, the environment, right? Um, uh, nighttime, things can be a lot more creepy, right? It, you might um, walk around a place in the daytime, no problem walk around that same place at night and feel a little uneasy because you don't know what's out there, right? Of course, drugs, alcohol, um, any kind of intoxication um, has the potential to do this as well. Animism, and animism is very important. Animism is, is the ooh, tendency to look at objects in the world or even the world itself as if it were alive, right? So animism is this tendency to project, uh, our, our, I guess you could say like our own animatedness out into the world. We see the world is inhabited by gods and spirits and the world is very much alive, right? That's animism. We can contrast that with animacy, which is, um, you know, something actually is alive if it's animate, right? Uh, Jens talks about animism, particularly with regard to children and who he calls primitive people. Um, children, because um, uh, children look at the world as if it's alive as well, right? Um, they engage in all kinds of pretend play uh, with their world. Not only are, are dolls or action figures uh, played with as if they were alive, um, or, or, or like stuffed animals, uh, but also, um, you know, imaginary friends or, or sticks or any number of things children can very easily act as if the thing is alive. And when Yen says primitive peoples, I think what he means are uh, like hunter gatherer societies or indigenous societies where, um, again, the world is not like this just a bunch of matter in motion, right? That's a very Western thing, um, which really comes from the ancient Greeks and Greek rationalism, right? The world is, is all the stuff out there. It's the cosmos. It's the ordered whole of existence. And humans can stand apart from the cosmos and use uh, logos, which is reason. We can use episteme, understanding. Uh, we can use noose, the intellect, right? We can use all of these things to understand the ordered whole, but we're separate from it. Uh, this is pretty unique to, to Western thought. In, uh, in like Eastern philosophy, African philosophy, in a lot of like indigenous religions and folklore, this just isn't a thing. Um, if you want to know, uh, if you want a really great example of, of what I'm talking about, watch, um, watch a, a, a Hayao Miyazaki film. Uh, you know, the Japanese Studio Ghibli, right? Watch um, Princess Mononoke or Spirited Away or, or My Neighbor Totoro. Uh, very, very good illustration of a world that is alive in the way that I'm talking about here. So wax figures can also cause an uneasy sensation and un, or an uncanny sensation, as can effigies, masks, uh, and corpses. I mean, has anyone ever been to a wax figure uh, museum? I have. And it's weird. Like, uh, I don't find them uncanny, but sometimes they look almost grotesque, right? Um, and effigies can be weird, too masks because they i mean masks are interesting because they cover the parts of the face that we need in order to uh, understand what other people are thinking you know uh we do a lot of mind reading based on facial expressions it's how we know um how people are feeling 
you know, their emotional expression on the face or uh, from eye movement, we can tell what people are looking at, what they're interested in. Masks cover that, which is why some people are uneasy uh, with masks. Corpses too, because corpses, as we'll see in a moment, uh, and as I mentioned a little bit last time, um, especially if, 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 you know, here I'm talking about like an open casket funeral uh, of somebody that you know. Um, that person was alive and you have this latent impression of their animatedness on your mind as you look at their corpse. Um, uh, corpses, I think, are one of the most uncanny things for this reason. For this reason. And there's other examples. We could go beyond this. You know, uh, clowns. A lot of people are afraid of clowns. And I think that's probably for similar reasons why masks can make people uncomfortable, right? Um, a big, giant, weird looking face on a clown uh, is just not the kind of stimuli you're used to dealing with uh, when it comes to looking at other human faces. So some people who are afraid of clowns, uh, that could be why, right? There's even uh, in my master's thesis when I was talking about the uncanny I use the example of the, uh, the photograph illusion. And maybe you've had this, uh, maybe you've seen this where there is a, an image of, of somebody in a photograph, right? Uh, or it could be a painting. Uh, painters used to exploit this trick. Uh, but the eyes of the photograph or the painting are such that they appear to follow you as you move across the room, even though they're not moving. That is very weird right? Um, uh, it's an illusion. It, this is the kind of thing anomalistic psychologists would love, right? Like, uh, is the photograph of my great, great, great grandmother watching me because her soul is stuck in there? Or is it an optical illusion, right? That's perfect for anomalistic psychology. But the main example that Jentsch uses of something that can initiate uh, or elicit an uncanny sensation with, with great regularity are automata. This is the second part of his paper, what we're getting into now. He says that uh, automata uh, can seem very uncanny when they appear to be united with certain bodily or mental functions. First of all, automata are the precursors to robots. So automata is plural for automatons. Um, mechanical figures uh, that would uh, to, you know, do different things. And they've been around for a very, very, very long time, by the way. Um, the ancient Greeks had automata. The first automata that we know of um, in ancient Greece were invented by a uh, hero of Alexandria. Um, and he created all kinds of mechanical wonders um, that were used in temples. So automatic doors, um, uh, figures which would move and dance uh, when people uh, lit the sacrificial fires, right? Um, really cool stuff. And auto automata were also very big in the modern period. You know, once we got out of the Middle Ages, we, we had the scientific revolution and the Renaissance, people started building them in Europe again. They had been building them uh, continuously in uh, the Middle East and in um and in Asia uh, before this, but when Europe was uh, climbing out of the dark ages, um, we, we got back into automata. Uh, Tim asks if I can explain, explain the automatic doors. Yeah, I mean, these would be doors that would be driven by some kind of steam powered mechanism uh, such, that, um, such that when uh, you light uh, the fire, you got to light a fire to make a sacrifice in ancient Greece, right? Um, uh, you're, you're burning these, you're burning offerings. So you got to light a fire. Um, so there's always fires going, there's water, there's early steam engines, all kinds of mechanisms that, um, that would, uh, that would cause, you know, figures to move. And some of them, some of them would be doors that would open like, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you're coming into the temple and you, um, you know, you step on the right spot and it just triggers the door to open or something. I'm actually not too sure on the details, but, um, uh, but yeah, that, that a lot of his, a lot of his stuff were, uh, 
they weren't like automatic sliding doors like we have today obviously they would have probably been like big wooden doors but very cool stuff so um uh in the in the um early modern period through the enlightenment um and into the 19th century automata were very popular um they were curiosities mechanical curiosities and people would uh come out to see them uh sometimes uh you'd see automata that could do um really interesting things like volcanson's digesting duck um it was claimed that it would actually digest food that was given to it it didn't really uh, what what you would do is give this little mechanical duck a bit of food and then it would uh you know poop out uh something as if it had digested the food and uh excreted it but of course it wasn't really digesting the food um there were automata that would appear to play musical instruments uh there are, are were a lot of automata in clocks right think of a cuckoo clock i mean those those were one of the uh those were one of the uh the ways uh not just the cuckoo clock with a literal bird but also you know uh some clocks uh in town squares in uh switzerland you can still go and see them to this day have little automata on trains that come out uh you know at the striking of the hour and ride around the clock and and have figures on the trains doing different things right so uh automata very popular um the precursors to robots robot it actually uh is a word that comes from the czech uh, robota and what it means is drudgery yeah back in the day um basically that in 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 uh in um what is now the czech republic the robota were like the peasants you know and there's similar words in uh throughout slavic languages like i believe the the russian for work is is also robota so it's like drudgery unpleasant labor uh menial labor that kind of thing um we started calling automatons robots uh because the term robot was popularized in a play uh about robots where a, a scientist creates some robots the robots um you'll never guess they rebel and kill all humans and then uh and then they have to discover love or something it's a cheesy play it's called rossum's universal robots but it's the very first story with robots called robots and inevitably they rebel against their human masters and kill the entire human race um so there you have it have you ever had a feeling of uncanniness or uncanny feelings of eeriness uh, when you're dealing with artificial intelligence uh not not personally there was a there was an instance where i um i was at a conference on uh philosophy and robotics in denmark where they had um uh, a small companion robot uh i believe it's called the telenoid robot it's it's just used as companion robot for uh people in like senior care centers and stuff like that um and i went up to it kind of like it was just sitting there uh, and I was just kind of like, oh yeah, that's an interesting looking thing. Um, but it had this, uh, this camera so that when you got, when you got within, um, interact, interaction dif uh, distance, uh, it, it could use this camera to, to track your eyes. So I was walking up, I was looking at it like, oh, this is a pretty cool robot. And all of a sudden its eyes just went like, like up and met mine. And I was like, oh wow that's weird um but when it comes to intelligence artificial intelligence i uh, that's been an interest since uh undergrad really that 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 a um i don't think and this is what i i actually argue in my in my master's thesis and, and some subsequent work that um sure uh, uh something that looks and moves a little strangely could be pretty uncanny but what would be really uncanny is if you had something that you knew was not alive yet convincingly displayed 
uh, thought and emotion the way a human would, that would probably be pretty weird. And I haven't experienced that myself, but I've thought a lot about it where, you know, if I had a mechanical looking robot who was saying, you know, I can think and feel just like you can, that would be strange. That would be quite strange, right? So yes, I, I, not, I not, not experienced it myself, but I do think about that a lot. And I think that, um, you know, uh, you can you can put yourself in the uncanny valley by going and looking up videos of robots, but also um, look up like uh, chat bots and virtual agents uh, when they do weird stuff. That's also quite quite strange. Um, so uh, let's get how are we doing for time? We're we've got we're only about an hour in, we may actually get through all of this today. And that will be cool because then next time we can, uh, we can talk, we can talk a little bit more about Freud and then we can just have like a big discussion about all this stuff, which sounds really fun. But, um, so, uh, let's just see what's in the chat here. Yes. I've heard of, I've heard of this replica. Uh, I think I've seen ads for that uh, where, you know, it's like, are you lonely? Uh, talk to Replica. It's kind of like that movie, Her, I guess. It's, it's a companion, a companion bot, but I, I, no, I'm, I'm okay. So uh, Jensch writes about um, human-like figures here. He says, for many sensitive souls, oh, excuse me. A life-size wax or similar figure also has the ability to retain its unpleasantness after the individual has taken a decision as to whether it is animate or not. Here, it is probably a matter of semi-conscious secondary doubts, which are repeatedly and automatically aroused anew when one looks again and perceives the finer details. Or perhaps it is also a mere matter of the lively recollection of the first awkward impression lingering in one's mind. So, um, it's kind of like, this is how I read this, and this is how I argued that it should be understood, is that um, say you see an automaton, and you very quickly make the decision uh, that it's just an automaton. But if it's moving in a way that gives you the impression that it's alive, um, that's quite automatic. Uh, per per perceiving animacy is very automatic. We can't just stop doing it. Right. So if I've got a robot or an automaton in front of me and I've, I've like, oh, I know that's just a, an inanimate object, yet it's moving as if it's animate. That is weird. Right. And that's the kind of thing Yench is talking about here. So. Uh, oh, <laughs> yes, I've seen these. Yeah. Netflix's AI is like uh, an uh, AI Christmas movie. They have a they have a yeah they have a christmas movie they have like a stoner comedy they have like a stand-up triangle yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. they're they're, they're <laughs> insane um <laughs> everyone should watch them. yeah <laughs> but they're quite good yes um so uh to continue Yench says this is where the impression easily produced by the automatic figures the automata belongs that is so awkward for many people a doll which closes and opens its eyes by itself or a small automatic toy will cause no noticeable sensation of this time or of this kind. Well, on the other hand, for example, the life-size machines that perform complicated tasks, blow trumpets, dance, and so forth, very easily give one a feeling of unease. The finer the mechanism and the truer to nature the formal reproduction, the more strongly will this special effect make its appearance. And that's basically the uncanny valley hypothesis right there in in Yench, um like 60 years before Maury came up with it so that's pretty cool so the affect of uncanny the sensation you get when you encounter something uncanny is a result Yench thinks of psychical uncertainty uh, today we'd call this mental or psychological uncertainty, right? But this uncertainty, uh, I think it's necessary to explain, um, to explain uh, 
uncanny experiences, but it might not be sufficient, right? But that's okay, because Yench has already kind of given us what we need. He ties the experience of uncanniness to uncertainty about something very specific. That is uncertainty about whether a living entity might not in fact be alive or whether an inanimate entity might in fact be animate. And that's why he lists effigies and wax figures and dolls and so forth. Uh, and that's why automata are, are his favorite running example. Um, it's not just psychical uncertainty. And that's very important when it comes to Freud because Freud is pretty uncharitable here. He kind of dismisses, oh, Jensch thinks it's uncertainty, but it can't be uncertainty. We're uncertain all the time about many things and we don't feel uh, the uncanny sensation every time we're uncertain. And I'm like, come on, Freud. It's uncertainty about animacy and mentation, not just uncertainty, right? And we can add, you know, CGI characters, uh, photographs, like I said earlier, they can be a little bit strange if they're not animated correctly. Or, you know, if you have a photograph whose um, eyes seem to follow you. Um, Jensch also draws this connection between the uncanny and animism, right? Right, the primitive sort of hunter-gatherer societies um have a more animistic worldview um and not just not just not just them uh as i said uh african philosophy asian philosophy is also a lot more animistic and a lot more holistic where we are part of a living world uh, and this we can contrast with the western view which comes from greek rationalism uh, and, and also to a certain extent from the Abrahamic religions, that the world is, is for us, but we stand apart from it. But we can understand it, we can use the stuff in it, you know, that's kind of like a Western synthesis of Greek rationalism and Abrahamic religion uh, that causes us to think that we're not part of the world, right? So in the West, I guess we're a little bit less animistic, culturally speaking, than uh, Africa, Asia, or, or, or uh, any number of indigenous cultures from around the world, right? So children are less discriminating between the animate and the inanimate. And there's a couple of funny examples in Yensch's paper, actually, that, I, that are just coming back to me. Um, you know, uh, Yensch mentions uh, Robinson Crusoe, one of the character Friday, who doesn't yet know. Uh, Friday is a wild man and he doesn't know about boiling water. So he sees a pot of boiling water and he thinks there's a creature stuck in the pot trying to get out. So he reaches in to try and, and, and get the creature out. That's one example of, of animism. Um, another one, uh, and this, this is funny because this actually came up in a neuroscience class I was teaching last uh, term when I was going on a tangent about animism and animacy. Um, but uh, imagine if you were a, a, you know, a sort of a wild person, you know, you lived in nature, you were a, a mountain person or something, uh, a, you know, one of the hill folk, and you came down from the hills and saw a steam engine for the first time, you might mistake it as a living being. Um, Jensch mentions such an example. Uh, there's even, and, and I know I'm, uh, this is incredibly nerdy, but do, but do we have any people who watch anime here? I've definitely watched a bit in the past. Yeah, Daniel says he has. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Daniel has High as five. well. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay, so I was watching that one uh, Demon Slayer, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's Didn't okay. You... Yeah. I like the yeah. animation. Uh, the animation yeah. is very, very neat looking. Very beautiful. Um but, but the, the Mugen train, right? Um, if you've seen that one, you know that, uh, you know that, that guy who wears the pig mask? Inosuke? Inosuke, yeah. He thinks, yeah. he thinks the train is the lord of the mountain. Like, he thinks it's a god, yeah. right? That's exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. And then it turns out there's a demon in the train and he's like, I told you, like. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing Yench is talking about here. Uh, that's the animistic worldview. And children are like this too, right? Like children 
look at the world as alive and um you know uh, it, it's it's great um or, or another funny example Yench mentions Yench also talks about animals a lot and and how uh the frightened uh fearful reactions of animals might be because they find or because they have uncertainty about things there was a an incident he mentions uh where there was a parade um taking place um and they had all kinds of elephants uh, different animals in this parade and uh I think one of the themes of the parade was the um, was Wagner's uh, uh, ring cycle, uh, or maybe not Wagner's because it's like a whole big production. But like the story of uh, of uh, the ring, the the ring of the uh, the Nibelungen lead is what I'm talking about. It's it's the uh, the ring of uh, Nibelung. It's a part of Germanic folklore. Uh, uh, you know, where you have like Siegfried and, and the dragon Fafner and all that stuff, right? So, um, so anyway, they've got this float with the dragon Fafner who starts blowing fire, and the elephants are like, What? and they stampede all over the place because they're frightened. Uh, and, and Yench is like, Well, that's because the elephants hadn't read the trilogy, of course, you know, he's joking, but it's true, A animals, um will kind of be like you know uncertain if they're uncertain about something and then you kind of familiarize them with it maybe hold out the object for them to smell it uh then they're not weird about it anymore um tolkien has some explaining to do eh uh why told what oh oh yeah <laughs> well tolkien you know tolkien was all about his germanic folklore uh i mean he he that's where he got all his cool ideas from um what was uh well hell all the dwarves in in the hobbit you know all the all the all of their names are right out of uh like the prose edda and the poetic edda from old norse myth totally i mean that's that was tolkien's bread and butter he was a philologist right so uh, he's spending all his days uh, translating Beowulf and writing The Hobbit. Um, but yeah, animals, uh, another interesting thing about animals that Yench mentions is, um, you know, sometimes we, uh, we, can, we can lessen their uncertainty by exposing them to the unfamiliar uh, thing, or we can uh, actually dampen their senses. Like uh, if you've ever seen horses pulling a carriage, you'll, you'll notice that they have these blinders to either side. That's because horses, um, uh, like we have binocular vision, we have forward facing eyes, but horses have uh, like side to side vision. So we have to put these blinders on because they might get distracted by stuff going on over there and get frightened, right? Uh, now, uh, on to Freud. I, I don't, we haven't read Freud yet, so I'm going to go fast here. And we'll, we'll, we might even revisit this next time and discuss it in more detail. But Freud explains the uncanny in terms of psychoanalysis, uh, in terms of return of the repressed. So there's elements in the psyche that are made unfamiliar because we repress them and they can return from repression. Uh, they may appear as symbols in dreams or in fantasies, or they could appear in our lives as anxieties or fears or other kinds of neurosis. So, and that's what I meant when I said that uh, for Yench, uh, the uncanny has like um, a, a incredible uh there's an incredible variety of things that can cause someone to experience an uncanny sensation. It could be because um, they're ill, intoxicated. It could be environmental. Maybe it's dark outside. Maybe it's noisy outside. Maybe you're in a creepy old house that someone told you was haunted. But it always has to do with mental uncertainty. And the uncertainty always seems to involve animacy and mentation. So those are his sort of general conditions. Freud says, if something is uncanny to you, it's because you don't have an integrated psyche. There's something wrong. Something has been repressed rather than being integrated into your psyche, health, like healthily, 
right? And that's why you're having creepy dreams or why you're afraid of this or you have that phobia. Um, it's because it's repressed, but it's returning from repression inevitably. And that's like a fundamental assumption in psychoanalysis, right? Is, is, is that things are repressed into the unconscious, um, but that they can return from repression. Now, Freud uh, talks a lot about Hoffman's short story, The Sandman. Uh, Gensch mentions Hoffman, uh, but doesn't talk about him in great detail. He mentions Hoffman's skill at using uncertainty to elicit an uncanny sensation in the reader. Um, but Hoffman, um, or but Freud, uh, as you'll see, spends quite a lot more um, space on Hoffman. So what happens um, in, in, uh, in The Sandman? Well, actually, has anybody started reading it yet? Yeah. I it's read like, sorry. Oh, right. sorry. I was just going to say I read the letters because, you know, it starts out with three letters and then then it's the storyteller uh, taking over. So what did everybody for those who started reading it? Let's go sort of one at a time. What did we think? Extremely. Oh, go ahead, Alexis. You had your hand up first. No, that's OK, Jay. If you can go first. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alexis, Sorry, no, JF and our, our yeah, JF and our friends from other classes. So this is just funny that we're all in the same class again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, um, well, I first off, like I've read the story multiple times, I guess, from different different classes and everything. Awesome. So every time I read it, it's um it's really great. But I also found that if we're talking about Freud and Yench, just with this, I really found that it's really interesting that there's an amalgamation of both authors' works in that one. Like if we're talking about like the mental illness aspect for um for Nathaniel and then for this as well, just talking about repressed emotions and repressed repressed memories. Yeah. When he was a kid, and then how it relates to how he's older. And so I really find that it's interesting. I don't think we my other class, I don't think we talked about it in its depth as this, but seeing those two authors, it's really cool to see the amalgamation of both of them accumulated in that one story. Yeah. So, and it's cool because Sandman uh, or Hoffman is doing this way before uh, Jensch and Freud even come along, right? Um, but yeah, it's true. Like Nathaniel has this weird experience with uh, Coppelius um, and, and the death of his father that, uh, and you know, Clara, his fiance, tries to convince him like, oh, it's all in your head. Like, don't worry about it. So there's absolutely the mental illness component, but there is also uncertainty about Olympia right who yeah <laughs> who is absolutely an automaton and when nathaniel finds out he kind of snaps right um so oh it's just such a good story so i, know. I feel like we're i feel like we're giving everything like away for everyone who hasn't like yet read it but... i know i know i i, I know <laughs> i don't i don't want to ruin it but it's just it's I so know. good it's so um, good yeah um, i also find it it's really interesting with just because the narration and the whole thing with the mental illness aspect, you're never sure if what you're reading is legitimate, you know, like that brings that in that whole uncertainty aspect of like, can you trust the narration? Because yeah. it's so, okay, I'm not gonna say anymore, but well, yeah. Well, like Daniel, Daniel, I think, is he, is he an unreliable narr or uh, Nathaniel, not Daniel, is Nathaniel an unreli uh, unreliable narrator? I think you can certainly make a case for that. But also then you have the, the other narrator after the letters who who i assume is always just somebody who was there um or who heard like oh i heard through the grapevine about this guy nathaniel like and um <clears throat> yeah we don't know how reliable any of these narrators are um and and again uncertainty right that's what yeah. makes the story so uh so creepy so, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Daniel. <laughs> uh, so next was uh, Jean-Francois and then Nathan. Yeah, so um, everything she said, no, but like, I, <laughs> it's really interesting again to see, like from my perspective, I went, this is the first time I read it, uh, I had to read it really slowly. There's definitely English that's used back then that we don't use today. Yeah. I don't think I've ever used the word nay in a sentence. 
but which, um which word nay <laughs> to, to to like say oh, no like nay i <laughs> nay. i say nay yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah i i uh, not big into warping but um the one thing i noticed again like you already touched base on it but i found it really interesting like, being a psych major like alexis is in psych as well uh just just touching base on like the schizoaffective disorder and how this guy is completely yeah you said like there's no case i, I don't want to spoil the story if anyone because I know what the ending's like. But, Everyone's just going to um, have to... Let's just not talk about the ending, okay? We'll just... Okay. We can talk about stuff, spoiler alert, but we won't talk about the ending. How so. he constantly misconstrues, like, the identities of others with, like, what he believes in his mind. And uh, just, like, yeah. how perception itself is completely subjective as opposed to objective. And you yeah. can't, like, hold him accountable as all, at all. Yeah, my two cents. Thank you for having me. Long time yeah. listener, first time Thank- talker. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for calling in today. All right, next up, we've got Nathan. Yeah, first of all, I just have to say, I'm a third year English major and I have not yet been assigned a Gothic story. So thank you so much. Oh man, no problem. I love this story. I love this story. It's so weird and cool. Um, Yeah, no, it was so good. Yeah. Um, But I I felt like it was really cool because I had read it kind of not quite thinking about the uncanny. Like certainly that, that part comes up after the letters. Um, but I was reading it more with like in the context of what we talked about in the first lecture, which was kind of like how we should go about being skeptical Mm. and like just those kinds of thoughts. And I thought it was interesting because each character kind of fills a role. Like you have Nathaniel who is like very, he's the romantic, um, and he's, he's not quite skeptical. He's, you know, what I'm trying to say. And then you have Clara who is that skeptic but it's also interesting because Hoffman isn't really he's not only like condemning or endorsing either side he's showing the flaws of both yeah. which I thought was super interesting um but yeah yeah because like the question of uh Nathaniel's reliability aside you know when he describes like when he realizes that Coppola is Coppelius when you know Professor Spallanzani and Coppola are fighting over Olympia and her eyes fall out um I'm kind of like oh well yeah I mean they sound like the same person I guess I'm okay you know and Clara Claire's the most reasonable person in the entire story which I find very interesting considering when this was written right like the character clara in her letter is just like you know uh, oh i'm just a i'm just a lady i don't know but really she she's the only reasonable person in this entire story yeah. and it's very it's very interesting to see what hoffman does with the female characters same with olympia who's just um you know like uh the model of of what women were expected to be socially at that time in Europe, you know, like attractive, quiet, you know, pr- pretty things, right? And, and Olympia is, as an automaton, she just, you know, kind of like has very limited responses, right? She kind of like chuckles and smiles and nods and can dance, um, but nothing else. And Nathaniel falls for her and and completely forgets about Clara, who's, you know, a real mm-hmm. actual woman who is also pretty smart and probably good, probably would be good for Nathaniel with his, you know, mental stuff going on. So I, I, yeah. I think I think it's very interesting how, how Hoffman treats treats women. Yeah, I feel yeah. like it kind of reads as like a almost feminist in a way because at the time it was like a literary convention for women writers to admit their um like inability to convey their thoughts in text yeah and 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 yet she's the most logical and like she's following that occam's razor type of thinking yeah just it's all in your head don't worry about it nathaniel like uh and like dahlia points out in the chat you know um they don't hesitate to mention how reasonable she is yeah like and that's an unfor- that's a, a, probably an unfortunate artifact of the times, right? Um, but but it is emphasized like like Hoffman goes out of his way to have Clara say, and to have Nath- Nathaniel say as well, like how clever Clara is. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that 
you know, for modern readers, when we go back, let's, oh, she's clever for a woman. Um, but that was just kind of the device that I think Hoffman had to use to, to establish that Clara is the smart one and Nathaniel is the possibly crazy one. So um, I, I won't summarize too much of the story for those who haven't read it, but I'll summarize the letters, right? Um, for those who are here, but who, who haven't read it yet. We have a series of letters that start off the story and Nathaniel is writing to his brother uh, Lothar. Uh, by the way, if the names are spelled different in my slides because when I initially put these together, I was actually working from a different translation where the names were actually kind of like updated and modernized. In this text, they're still old, kind of old timey spelling. But Nathaniel is telling his brother Lothar uh, that, or, or, or rather tell Lothar, who is his, his future brother-in-law, it's the brother of his fiance Clara. Uh, he's telling him about, oh, I've just been feeling, you know, very, uh, very strange lately. I had this, uh, I've been in Italy studying with uh, Professor Spallanzani, of course, and uh, I ran into this lens salesman uh, and, and I freaked me out because he reminded me of uh, the Sandman. So it goes kind of goes back to uh, Nathaniel's um, childhood when he's recounting the story of how he'd, he'd hang out. Um, they'd, his family would have dinner. Um, after dinner, they'd all go up to the study and, and Nathaniel's father would smoke a pipe and drink a glass of beer and entertain the kids, tell them stories. But then at nine o'clock, they'd hear the heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. And, and uh, Nathaniel's mother would always say, well, the Sandman's coming. We have to get you off to bed. Now, of course, the Sandman is part of European folklore. The Sandman is uh, a guy who comes and sprinkles sand in children's eyes to make them fall asleep. It's fairly benign. And this is what uh, Nathaniel's mother means. Like, got to go to bed. The Sandman's coming. You know, no, no big deal. But he, he, uh, he, he hears uh, all of this racket going on upstairs and, and, he thinks it's all quite suspect. So he asks his uh, nanny about, about the Sandman and, and Nathaniel's nanny has a different uh, explanation. She explains like, oh no, the Sandman, you don't want to mess with the Sandman because the Sandman, you see, uh, he'll come and pluck out your eyes if you don't go to bed on time. And he'll take them to his children who live on the moon and his children have these horrible hooked beaks like owls and they'll gobble up the eyes of children who don't go to bed. And this scares the crap out of Nathaniel, obviously. But he's also curious, right? He needs to know. So he's telling Lothair, I, I had to know who the Sandman was. So he sneaks upstairs and he sees that um, the Sandman uh, or who he was told was the Sandman, was the lawyer Coppelius. And Coppelius and Nathaniel's father are engaged in these weird alchemical experiments. If you read between the lines, what you'll realize is they're actually fashioning a pair of eyes out of glass, um, which is weird. And also, uh, the smoke, the setting... Nathaniel talks about being able to see figures in the background without eyes, which um, really creepy and which, which is actually something I only noticed on my most recent reading uh, that that stuck in there and that kind of becomes important for later. It's, it's foreshadowing basically, right? Um, so uh, he's, he's found out. Coppelia sees him and puts him up by the uh by the uh the fire that they're working on you know they're hammering away with all these weird little instruments and Coppelius grabs him and says oh we've got some nice eyes here and he's about to sprinkle hot coals in the in Nathaniel's eyes and Nathaniel's father begs him not to so he just like kind of roughly manhandles him almost like to you know just 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 roughs him up until he passes out Nathaniel doesn't wake up for a few days um when he does wake up he's he's like oh no is the sandman still here on the sandman's last visit coppelius's last visit there's an explosion heard upstairs uh which leaves nathaniel's father dead and uh coppelius is nowhere to be found 
and uh, and uh, basically he's telling, you know, Nathaniel is telling Lothar that he believes that uh, Coppola, this lens salesman he's met in Italy, is this Coppelius. Now, uh, he's uh, very absent-minded, so um, even though Nathaniel wrote his letter to Lothar, he accidentally addresses it to Clara. So Clara reads it. Clara is very reasonable, as we were just discussing, and Clara says, um it's it's all in your in, in your head you know you had this horrible experience but like how could Coppelius and Coppola be the same person Coppelius was German Coppola is Italian um you know it come on think about it it's it's fine you know don't worry about it and Nathaniel writes back uh saying that um oh I'll oh, Clara you're so smart of course you're right I it, not the same person at all. I've confirmed this because I've gone and, uh, you know, I've done some digging and, and, and they couldn't be the same person. Um, and then he mentions Olympia, uh, the daughter of the professor who is kept in the professor's room. And, and, and we see Nathaniel kind of getting curious, like, who is this woman in this room who just sits there quietly all day she, he wonders at one point in the letter like whether she's an idiot uh unfortunately back then idiot was a technical term right an, 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 an idiot referred to somebody with an iq below 25 um uh an imbecile was 25 to to 50 i believe and 50 to 70 was a moron so this is this is all this is all part of what's called the euphemism treadmill um you know so nowadays we call people idiots back then it was like a, a medical diagnosis it's the same reason we don't use the term mental retardation anymore because people have turned it into a slur um so we don't say it anymore because of the euphemism treadmill um it, it's it's it we can't use it in a technical sense anymore because it's used uh, to insult people and be mean to people. So we got to come up with a different term. And that's the euphemism treadmill. So that's what Nathaniel means. Like, oh, maybe she's an idiot. Like, it's not like we would mean it today. It, maybe she can't go outside. Maybe she has to be cared for because she has a disability, right? So uh, that's where uh, the letters end. And then the narrator picks up. And I won't say any more about uh, the story if I can help it because I want everybody to go and read it. Oh, let's, let's skip all that. Okay, so uh, Jensch argues that it's Olympia uh, and uncertainty about her identity and uncertainty also about who uh, the Sandman is. Is he Coppelius? Is Coppola also Coppelius? Are they both the Sandman? It's this uncertainty that Jensch um, thinks is what makes the story uncanny. Freud goes in a completely different direction, right? Um, Freud thinks that it's the titular character, the Sandman, uh, who uh, wants to take Nathaniel's eyes in the beginning by sprinkling these hot coals in them and making them pop out. That's what's uncanny. And why is it uncanny? Because Freud interprets this as castration angst or castration anxiety, uh, and that that is returning from the repressed. Um, you see, Coppelius, uh, Freud thinks, represents the father figure. And the eyes represent the genitals. And this is the thing with Freud, right? Like Freud is drawing more on like mythology and stuff uh, than actual science uh what he's referring to here um is is something you see in in greek myth like like uh like like the titanomachy for example right who's who's familiar with uh with ancient greek mythology anybody alexis am, but it's been a while so even if we mention some things i will not really recall them as much okay how about daniel um, a little bit. I, I took two weeks of a course once, but sometimes I read up on different Wikipedia pages. I know that castration is, is, uh, you know, part of that conflict in the, in the Greek mythology. There's, there's a, 
a sort of a pattern of succession in, in the mythology. Exactly. Um, uh, uh, Zeus's father, um, Cronus, who was a Titan, uh, feared Zeus and his children. So he, uh, he ate them all, um, but, uh, but not Zeus. Uh, Zeus was taken away and raised in a cave. And, um, and, and uh, when he grew up, he freed his brothers and sisters and uh, engaged in a war against the Titans, the Olympians versus the Titans. And the Olympians win this war. And what Zeus does is he castrates his father and he throws the leftovers in, into the ocean. And, and a bunch of other gods are created that way too. So, uh, and, and, um, and Cronus had done the same thing to his father, Uranus. So yeah, it, it's like there's a, a succession where the children inevitably rebel uh, against the parents and take away their power. And that's what the castration is supposed to symbolize, is taking away of the power, right? Uh, so here in the story, Fro uh, Freud is saying, Coppelius is like a father figure and he's trying to keep the power. He wants to take Nathaniel's eyes and Nathaniel's afraid of losing his power. And if you're reading this and you find this, um, if you find this uncanny, it's because, well, maybe you have a little bit of castration anxiety. Um, I find this a bit weird, obviously. Um, and, and there are a number of reasons why. One is that psychoanalytic explanations like this one are not very scientific, of course. We cannot test, uh, we cannot generate hypotheses and test them. Uh, that was one of the main criticisms of Freud was that none of his stuff was able to be tested or retested. Exactly. And that's why Freud to this day is still big in the humanities, but not in the social sciences, at least not as big. Psychology, they're not fans of Freud. Uh, anthropology and sociology, you do. Um... Oh, okay. Daniel, you might, you might be correct. You might be correct there. Um, uh, could be Kronos castrating Uranus because that's where like Aphrodite and 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 uh, and some of those gods came from. You could be correct. Um, I'll have to check on that. But yeah, uh, that is true. <clears throat> As psychology started becoming a science, um, we realized we 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 couldn't really formulate hypotheses and and test them, and that's important, right? Falsifiability is important. But uh, Freud, nonetheless, con continues to be very influential in the humanities. And I think that's actually probably for the better. Um, if I want to understand the mind, Freud is not the guy I go to first. But if I want to understand art or, or a story or, or, or a myth, Freud is actually pretty good for that, I think. In fact, I would encourage everybody who's interested to check out the film uh, the Pervert's Guide to Cinema. Uh, that's a film by Zizek. If you, in, in case you don't know uh, Slavoj Zizek, he's 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 an interesting guy. He's a philosopher in the continental tradition. Um, really weird dude, but um, he does this uh, film where he talks about great films from a psychoanalytic perspective, uh, and and it's filmed in such a way that. You know, like they show a bit of the movie and then Zizek is in the scene talking about the film. Uh, it, it, it's good. I highly recommend you check it out. This is the kind of thing that I think is that Freud is good for. Um, also, when it comes to fear of the eyes, one need not fear. Uh, one, one need not explain fear of damage to the eyes as castration anxiety. There are very good evolutionary reasons why we would protect our eyes so much. I mean, in humans, sight is arguably our dominant sense. And it's reflexive, right? Like if something gets close to your eye, you, you, you just reflexively close your eye because sight is so important for human beings. Um, another, thing, another thing about Freud for me is that, you know, he claims that he's talking about uncanniness in his paper and that the titular character, the Sandman, is who is really uncanny. I think that he's actually just more frightening. 
than uncanny. Uh, he wants to take Nathaniel's eyes. I mean, that's just kind of grotesque and horrifying. But it's not eerie or weird in, 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 in the same way that like uh, an uncanny automaton is. So I think Yensch gets the answer right. I think that if there's anything uncanny about the story, it's, it's actually the uncertainty as to the Sandman's true identity and what he wants with Nathaniel. Um, but Freud does, uh, I'll, I'll go through this quickly because, uh, you know, we haven't read Freud yet and I, I kind of want to revisit some of this next time, but, but Freud does come up with other examples of uncanniness. There's the doppelganger. I read about the doppelganger, uh, I think way, way back when, when I was young in, in these like unexplained mystery books that you used to be able to find at the library. I used to read those. I thought those were pretty cool. And the doppelganger or double goer is your double. And uh, I mean, I I've never had that experience where I look at somebody who looks uncannily like me and I almost think, oh, is what? Like, is that me? Um, I have seen people who look like people I know. And that's really weird. Like just the other day, I was walking through the market and I saw a guy walking towards me. And from far away, he looked exactly like uh, a childhood friend who I still keep in touch with today. And, and I, I, I'm looking, I'm like, is that John? Is that my friend John? And, oh no, it's a different guy. Whoa, that was weird though. That moment when I was not sure who it was, was kind of uncanny. There's also deja vu, right? Deja vu means already seen. Um, and, and if you've had an experience of deja vu, you'll know it feels kind of weird, doesn't it? Strange coincidences. Um, there is uh, an example where Freud's talking about when he's in Italy and he's lost and he, he keeps coming back to this town square where there are all these women um, hanging around uh, wearing rouge and skimpy dresses. Freud is trying to say without saying it that um, he went into the red light district. Like, uh, he's like, oh, I, I kept winding up there and, and I kept trying to get out of there, but I, all these streets I was unfamiliar with and I kept ending back in the red light district and then I started to wonder what must people be thinking of me? Uh, so that's a strange coincidence, uh, strange repetitions. Uh, another coincidence he mentions is um, he, had, he, he had a patient who um, uh, was uh, at the sanitarium. Um, yeah, kind of like Jung's synchronicity. I have to admit, I'm much less familiar with Jung than with Freud. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely some commonalities there. And this one, this one, uh, so this one patient uh, of a sanitarium uh, would go there uh, to take them out in air and, and it was good for his health. And he had like this favorite nurse who worked there. I think he probably had a crush on this nurse or something. So he's telling Freud how he goes back to the, the, the place and um, was like, I, I, wanna, I want this room because that's the room where nurse so-and-so works. And uh, she says, oh, uh, that room's already been taken. So this man says, oh, well, may that guy be struck dead. Two weeks later, he dies, like just dies of a heart attack. And, uh, and so this guy tells Freud, like, it felt so weird, like it was such a weird coincidence. Freud's patient called this the omnipotence of thought, this idea that thought can affect the world. Nowadays, we call this magical thinking. But it's another thing that Freud uh, kind of sticks in there with, with, with stuff that can cause you to experience an uncanny sensation, right? But for all of this to actually work, Freud does one thing that uh, is a little bit sneaky. You know, he says at first, right, he says, oh, Yensch thinks it's psychical uncertainty, but it can't just be psychical uncertainty. Well, remember, Yensch, Yensch is talking about uncertainty about animism and mentation. And then what does Freud do here? He goes, Oh, well, we got to appeal to an animistic worldview. 
uh, it's repressed when we adopt more rational ways of looking at the world as we age. But nonetheless, it's animism. He writes, the analysis of cases of the uncanny has led us back to the old animistic view of the universe. A view characterized by the idea that the world was peopled with human spirits, by the narcissistic overrating of one's mental processes, by the omnipotence of thoughts and the technique of magic that relied on it, by the attribution of carefully graded magical powers or mana to alien persons and things, and by all the inventions with which the unbounded narcissism of that period of development sought to defend itself against the unmistakable sanctions of reality. Now, remember, this, this, is what Jensch, uh, this is what Freud said at the beginning of his essay. He says, on the whole, Jensch does not go beyond relating the uncanny to the novel and the unfamiliar. For him, the essential condition for the emergence of a sense of the uncanny is intellectual uncertainty. One would suppose then that the uncanny would always be an area in which uh, a person was unsure of his way around. The better oriented he was in the world around him, the less likely he would be to find the objects and occurrences in it uncanny. So I just think that's a little bit strange. Um, you know, it's a little bit uncharitable of Freud uh, to say like, oh, he doesn't really go beyond animus or, or uh, uh, you know, uncertainty. Like what? The whole second half of the paper is about uh, automatons and, and wax figures and corpses and stuff. And he's very specific. Jensch is very specific that it's uncertainty about whether uh, an inanimate object may in fact be animate or whether an animate being may in fact be inanimate or whether one of those entities is imbued with mental functions. And it's just so strange that yes, Freud is still, you know, doing a psychoanalytic sort of take on this. He's still saying it's the return of the repressed it, in the Sandman. It's, it's return of uh, castration anxiety, but uh, in the rest of the, when it comes to the rest of the thing, what's returning from repression is your animistic worldview, which you had when you were a kid, uh, or which humans had when humans were all more primitive. You know, I say primitive, uh, primitive has a sort of unfortunate, you know, can have a sort of derogatory ring to it. Uh, but, but what Freud means is just when humans were not as developed, I guess. Still, though, I think that's a little bit unfair. I think that there really is something to be said for looking at the world as a living system that we are a part of, um, which unfortunately we've kind of lost, you know, thanks to Greek rationalism and the Abrahamic religions and, and that whole Western th synthesis. But, but yeah, um, so it's the return of the repress, but animism and animacy. Um, which I just think is funny. It's, it's like Freud kicks, kicks animism out the front door uh, when he starts his essay, and then he lets it back into the back door at the end. And it's just a little unfair to Yench, I think. I remember I said that uncertainty might be a necessary con condition to elicit uh, uh, the uncanny, but it may not be sufficient. Rather, uh, maybe one of the sufficient, uh, sufficient conditions is, is what the uncertainty is about. Um, animacy and mentation, I maintain. And of course, Jensch has also pointed out in his paper that there are individual differences in uh, susceptibility to the uncanny. Uh, Freud, Freud seems to agree with this. Freud is not that prone to experiencing uncanny sensations. But again, the key takeaway is that it's uncertainty. Oh, excuse me. Uncertainty about specific things. Uh, not just uncertainty in general. That's the, that's the key uh, for Yench. So maybe the conditions that reliably elicit uh, uncanny sensations are really all about uncertainty about animacy and mentation and not uncertainty in general, right? Now, Freud thought uncertainty was uh, not sufficient to explain this, but I don't know. I just think it's funny that he comes back to animism uh, and this leads him to conclude uh, some things that are uh, uncannily similar to Jensch's conclusions. In any case, Freud writes, the analysis of cases of the uncanny has led us back to the old animistic view of the universe. Oh, wait, I already read that. 
<laughs> compare this to Yench. Compare the bit that I but that I read earlier to Yench, who writes, an important factor in the uncanny is the natural tendency of man to infer, in a kind of naive analogy with his own animate state, that things in the external world are also animate, or perhaps more correctly, are animate in the same way. It is all the more impossible to resist this psychical urge, the more primitive the, the individual's level of intellectual development is. Further, it is not astonishing uh, if that which man himself semi-consciously projected into things from his own being now begins to terrify him in those very things, or that he is not always capable of exercising the spirits which were created out of his own head from that very head. The inability thus easily produces the feeling of being threatened by something unknown and incomprehensible that is just as enigmatic to the individual as his own psyche usually is as well. So really, despite Freud's disagreement with Jentsch, um, I think the two of them actually agree on quite a lot. Um, and it's just that Freud, uh, you know, Freud, Freud's got to have everything framed in psychoanalytic terms, right? That's his claim to fame, psychoanalysis. So I don't know. I suspect that Jentsch and Freud have more in common than Freud himself would have thought. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Well, we're nearly through the end of this round of slides. So what about eeriness? I've been saying... Uh, things that are uncanny can elicit a sense of eeriness. But what's that? I think it's an emotion. But first, what are emotions? Well, emotions are affective states. Um, they're feelings. But they're not just feelings. They're episodic feelings. And they occur in response to important events or people or objects or scenarios or whatever. So emotions are affective states that are episodic, unlike moods, which are, uh, moods are not really episodic. You know, um, emotions are about an event or a thing that happens, they last a little bit, and then they go away. Moods are long lasting and may not have, um, may not have an intentional sort of object or content in the same way that emotions do. So like a, a, an emotion would be like sadness, in response to a loss. A mood would be like depression or melancholy, right? Um, so according to Diana and Taroni, who have written a really good book about emotions uh, that you could check out here if you like, um, emotions have phenomenology, intentionality, oh my goodness, I can't stop yawning, and epistemology. That means that emotions... Um, there's something that it's like to have them. That's what the phenomenology means. So, you know, fright feels different than happiness, which feels different than surprise. Uh, they have intentionality. They're about something. And they have epistemology. Uh, they, they have correctness uh, and justification conditions, which a lot of people, when they hear that, like, wait, my emotions can be wrong? Yes, they can. They absolutely can. Um, and, and in this way, emotions are uh, a means to, to knowledge, um, right? Like imagine uh, if you were angry at somebody, usually anger is a response to a perceived slight or, um, or an injustice, you know, an offense against you. So you get angry. Um, so uh, is your anger correct? Well, um, for it to be correct, there would have had to have been an actual offense against you. And for your anger to be justified, you would have to have some reasons for believing there was an offense against you. And if one of those two conditions is not there, then your anger is inappropriate. You know, maybe someone lied and said, hey, so-and-so said that uh, Josh's paranormal class is, uh, is terrible. He teaches you that ghosts are real and, and that psychics are real. And I'm like, what? I'm a, oh, uh, let me talk to this guy. Um, so that's my justification, but it's a poor justification because maybe that person was lying, right? Uh, and then maybe I should get mad at the guy who told me that and not the guy who this guy said, said that, right? 
Emotions are also valenced, so they can be positive or negative, right? Uh, they can be positive in, this, in, in, in terms of how they feel, uh, or they could be positive or negative, um, like in terms of morality. There are moral emotions, for example. Um, so an emotion that feels uh, bad would maybe be fear or sadness. Um, um, uh, a negative emotion, like a morally negative emotion, uh, might be disgust, right? Um, but then again, it all depends on context. Disgust could be a good thing if there is a good reason to actually be disgusted by something. And disgust evolved to protect us from germs and stuff out there and that kind of thing after all, right? Uh, emotions are often also accompanied by judgments. Um, some have even argued that emotions are judgments. Like Jesse Prince argues that emotions literally are embodied judgments about the significance of whatever's going on, the thing that was said to you, the event that's happening, the person you're talking to. And of course, emotions are accompanied by all kinds of changes in the body. Changes in the facial expressions are probably some of the most salient, but also body posture. Um, your respiration rate can go up or down depending on your emotional uh, state. Uh, skin conductance, so that means the level of sweat. Uh, when you're Nervous, for example, you get sweaty, uh, but if you're happy, um, well, hopefully you don't get very sweaty if you're happy, I don't know. It's not good to be happy and sweaty. And your hormone levels will change, of course. Imagine if you're frightened, your adrenaline level will increase. Adrenaline is a hormone, right? So um, now some theorists like Richard Lazarus think that emotions are primarily cognitive. They're primarily judgments. And others think that they're more like perception. This, this would be people like, uh, William James and Carl Lang, who famously have the James Lang theory of emotion. Jesse Prince, more recently, in his book Gut Reactions, uh, puts forward a perceptual theory of emotion where emotions are embodied judgments. You know, for Lazarus, if I'm afraid of the charging bear, uh, my fear is what causes me to make the judgment, oh, that's dangerous. I should get out of here. But for Prince, your fear is that judgment, right? Now, no theory of emotion completely accounts for uh, all emotions, but many people agree that emotions represent important things, right? So fear represents danger and prepares the organism to get out of the dangerous situation. Sadness often represents a loss. Uh, anger an injustice and a desire to retaliate possibly happiness tells us that something good has happened or you know we've gained something we've accomplished something so where does eeriness fit in here if eeriness is an emotion i think that eeriness is a type of fear specifically it's a type of anxiety see there's different ways we can break the emotions down um, there's fright, which is like, you know, I'm afraid of the charging bear or something, but there's other kinds of fear as well. Shock or horror, right? Imagine if, um, you know, you're in some kind of horror movie situation and you discover, um, you know, your friend didn't make it out of the house on time. They're dead. The ghost face got him, right? But uh, you, you might be like, ah, right? Like, so that's another type of fear. But there's also anxiety. Anxiety is also a type of fear, which according to Richard Lazarus is all about uncertainty. So uh, anxiety, you know, you usually in, in this list here, you know, fear, whoops, is about danger. Sadness is about loss. Anxiety is about uncertainty. And sometimes we can be uncertain how things are going to go. Uh, like, like performance anxiety is a very good example of this, right? Uh, what was I doing the other day? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I did like an, uh, an open mic thing uh, with my partner for the first time. And like, I haven't been on stage in forever. And I was like really nervous before because I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. I haven't done this in a long time. So that's normal. That's that's anxiety, uncertainty. I don't know how this is going to go, right? 
or you know if you're applying to school or for a job that you really want or going to grad school or something or applying for a scholarship and you're waiting you're waiting to hear back isn't that just the worst you know because you're you're anxious right you're like how's it gonna go what are the results gonna be i don't know ah that's anxiety i think eeriness is a kind of anxiety where the uncertainty is whether the animate may in fact be inanimate or vice versa and whether um such things are endowed with mental functions so this gives eeriness its peculiar phenomenology um you know eeriness is strange it's strange it's a strange emotion and it feels unlike any other emotion when you experience it and i think that when we feel eeriness that sense of eeriness it's because we may be misperceiving a presence or a mind or a spirit or anything like that in one's environment. I mean, why are haunted houses spooky, right? Because of schemas we've, uh, anyways, well, <laughs> we've fabricated every. <laughs> okay, I'll, yeah. I, I'll, 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 <laughs> that's true. But um, so first, though, Daniel asked, do you think yeah. that there is a relation of the uncanny or eerie to the sublime? Yeah, um, actually, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, uh, um, in one work I'm aware of uh, by Min Su Kang, uh, in his book on automatons um in the modern year, uh, period in europe uh he treats the uncanny as uh the opposite of the sublime and the sublime is um the sublime for for people who aren't familiar is what stirs one's emotions but in like a good way right it, uh, like imagine listening to a beautiful piece of music and and having your emotions uh, being being affected or looking at like a, a gorgeous sunset um, you know that that or a beautiful piece of art that's the sublime something that's so beautiful it stirs the emotions um, and the uncanny could be the opposite of that at least that's how Kang treats it so but like why are haunted houses spooky or creepy well I think that uh let me just go back a slide here. So imagine you're in a haunted house. First of all, uh, as Jean-Francois said, yes, we do have these concepts and schemas of what uh, a spooky, scary house looks like. But this is actually grounded in, it's actually very interesting how this came about. So if I say haunted house, chances are you're imagining an old broken down victorian house are you not yeah exactly like when you think of a haunted house you think of like norman bates's house in psycho or or something like that like a creepy old victorian house on top of a hill why it's not just because that's what we shown in movies why were those the houses shown in movies well during the um the Edwardian period and up until the Gilded Age, a lot of people with money built these kinds of houses, these old Victorian manors. And then the Great Depression hit. And a lot of them were abandoned and became derelict and started to look old and creepy. So that's why in the 50s and the 60s, when uh, Hitchcock and those guys were making horror movies, all the creepy houses were old Victorian mansions. Um, and of course, there's a bit of a gothic influence in the Victorian period too, which also makes things kind of dark and, and creepy. But say you're in one of these old broken down houses, it's big, it's dark, it's drafty. Maybe there's some photographs hanging on the walls whose eyes appear to follow you. Maybe you can hear noises that you cannot explain or feel a draft, even though the window's closed. And you may misinterpret that as a sort of presence a being perhaps a ghost right uh so i think this lends itself to a number of different explanations of paranormal phenomena and our reactions to those phenomena as well as Jensch says at the end of his paper 
The human desire for the intellectual mastery of one's environment is a strong one. Intellectual certainty provides psychical shelter in the struggle for existence. However it came to be, it signifies a defensive position against the assault of hostile forces and the lack of such certainty is equivalent to lack of cover in the episodes of that never ending war of the human or an organic world for the sake of which the strongest and most impregnable, impregnable bastions of science were erected. So um, basically for Yench, it seems to come down to uh, unease about the unknown and the unfamiliar, Masoneism, as he calls it in his paper. Um, and I agree. I agree largely with Yench. I think Freud, uh, I'm glad he agrees when it comes to the animism and stuff like that. But, you know, Freud frames this all in terms of psychoanalysis, which I, I do disagree with. Um, so in this talk or in this lecture, what I've tried to do is argue that a, a naturalized understanding of the uncanny could not only give us some insights on interesting stuff like um, the uncanny valley phenomenon or discussion in the humanities, but it would also make a good contribution to anomalistic psychology. So I've tried to adjudicate between Jensch and Freud. Uh, both have their disagreements, as we've seen, but both uh, assign an important role to animism and animacy. Um, and I've tried to sketch out what I think eeriness is like, if it is an emotion. It is an emotion that's elicited by stimuli that we call uncanny, stimuli that we may be mentally uncertain about. It's a type of anxiety whose content is uncertainty about the animacy uh, of the entity we are faced with, as well as whether it possesses mental functions like thought, emotion, uh, a soul, as some might put it. And that is all I have for today. So, um, wow, I didn't think I was going to get through all of that, but we did. Uh, so that means for next time, I think that what I'll do is go over, what we'll do is we'll go over the rest of the Sandman story. We'll revisit Freud, and uh, once everybody's read Freud, and talk a little bit more about that. And then I think what we should try and aim to do is kind of get some discussion going about the relation between the paranormal and the uncanny, and whether uh, some of what I've talked about today can explain, uh, on the one hand, uh, purported paranormal events, and on the other, our responses to them, and whether it can't. Let's test this theory by you know talking about it and hashing it out, and just seeing what explanatory power it has. So that, that's what I'd like to do for next time since we've got through everything here. So this was great. Um, what a great class. Let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, well, yeah, I guess that's all for today. Um, does anyone have any questions before we go? Daniel, go ahead. Oh, was I muted? I think you were muted, yeah. yeah. Damn, okay. I was just saying, I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask, but they're kind of tangential, so I don't know if other people have more direct questions they want to ask first. Um, well, if you don't mind, we can just see if, uh, if anyone has any other questions. It doesn't look like it. Yeah, no. Might as well just go ahead, Daniel. Sure, okay. Well, I guess my questions are kind of mostly just kind of for you and kind of what you think. So like, in the, for instance, you mentioned like the kind of the Western idea of, of like a distinction between like humans and the world. And I think that's true that we have that idea. Um, but you sort of, you sort of trace that idea back to sort of, you know, Greek rationalism. And I mean, I've, I've I haven't done extensive study of, of Greek culture and stuff like that, but I mean, I, I guess this is, just, this is just my thoughts. Uh, like the Greek worldview is full of, you know, all sorts of gods, right? Like, the, so the world is full of gods and you have to like exist in relation to these gods. You know what I mean? So, it's, so like, even though it's not like, I suppose one organism, the idea that there's like quite a sharp divide between, you know, humans and nature 
I guess my my reaction is that that seems like a much later kind of distinction, or at least the emphasis we have on it seems to be like a much later distinction. Well, Does that make uh, sense? I, I see what you're saying. Um, and it's true, the Greeks were animists. Uh, and and Yench actually mentions this in, in his paper. He says something like, even in uh, highly sophisticated ancient Greece, a, a dryad still lived in every tree. Dryads are little tree spirits, right? And... Um, the ancient ancient Greek religion, uh, we'll call it mythos, right? This is um, this is um, this is mythos versus logos. Mythos uh, appeals to the gods and animism uh, in order to explain things, um, and and this was uh, this was how the Greeks saw the world. It started to change around the time of the pre-Socratic philosophers, right? And that's where Greek rationalism really gets going. It was, I believe, um, you know, Thales who got everything kicked off by saying, uh, I, I don't want to explain the world. You know, and I'm obviously paraphrasing here because we, I don't think we have any of Thales' direct writings. Um, but but uh, Thales decides, you know what, I'm not going to explain the world with mythos, I'm going to do it with logos, and I'm going to try and use my reason and apply it to the cosmos, the ordered whole of existence, and try and understand it. And that's really what kicked it off. Um, of course, um, as you get closer to the classical period and into the classical period with uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, by then, um, uh, Greeks um, were... Um, probably a lot less religious than they were um, in the centuries previous to this. Um, and and this, this has kind of ebbed and flowed throughout history. I mean, there are periods that are uh, a lot yeah, more religious. Yeah, well, because even Plato makes his own myths. Yeah, exactly. Like Plato would come up with his own uh, kind of like allegories that were grounded in myth to use, um, to use like uh, pedagogically right it was it was like didactic it was it was to teach stuff um but that was actually something that was starting to change and 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 i think laypersons have that misconception that oh the greeks were always worshiping zeus like all the time and it's like well i mean they were for a long time but there were periods in the ancient greek world when uh people didn't really believe in the old gods anymore i mean plato Plato just says God. He doesn't talk about... He Plato's understanding of God is a lot closer to the Christian idea of God than it is to Zeus. Um, and, and that's probably why God in Christianity um, is depicted the way he is, because uh, the Neoplatonists uh, did influence uh, some of that Christian thought, right? Um, so yeah, um, it, it, it's tricky, uh, but I would say that uh, the mythos was mythos was established. Mythos had been there a lot. Mythos was was what the Greeks used to understand the world since before Homer. But then with the pre-Socratic philosophers, and then once we get into the classical period, that's when that really started to change, and that's kind of stuck in the Western tradition and been merged with the Abrahamic outlook that the world was created for us, right? Like, you know, Genesis, here's, here's the Garden of Eden, here's all the animals, and you can do whatever you want, just don't eat the fruit of knowledge kind of thing, right? So that's, that's my explanation of that. Sure, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, and then the other question I have is, I suppose, just kind of um, about naturalism in general, because I think yeah, I am in the quad. Yeah, um, <laughs> I because uh, I, th I, th I think you, you sort of just said, you know, you sort of subscribe to like a largely naturalist sort of view of things. And 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 I think I would largely agree, you know, just because I mean, science seems like a pretty useful thing. It seems to have been able to do some pretty remarkable things. And it seems important that we recognize that. Yeah. Um, but then like I just I like. Even even without going into paranormal things, there are just things that um, 
I seem think seem to fall. I mean, I'm kind of a Platonist, I suppose. So, so you could say that's one way. But but even without that, so because we talked a bit about emotions today, and, and that's kind of sorry, I'm kind of stumbling on my words. But I guess I I, I want your thoughts like on how, how emotions fit into like a naturalistic worldview because if I ask you the question, right, um, like, you know, what is it like to be in love, right? It seems that a naturalistic answer is just actually like a, like a kind of category error with respect to answering that question. All, and then we would also say, the, however, that question should have an answer, right? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think part of this stems from people's difficulty in assimilating emotions into a rational worldview. Uh, and again, thank Plato for that, right? The, the chariot, the, you know, the chariot analogy and all that, like you've got reason and the passions and they're at odds with one another. And that continued all the way up to Descartes and, and onward. But I just don't think that's true. Um, uh, for me, as a naturalist, uh, like emotions evolved. Uh, we, we, humans evolved and emotions are one of the things that evolved along with us and, and emotions serve very important functions. Um, so uh, one of the ways that emotions contribute to reasoning uh, is, is in uh, axiology, right? Emotions help to tell us what we value. Emotions put us in touch with our values, right? Another thing that emotions can do is help us to reason about right and wrong. Um, so when I mentioned the moral emotions, uh, disgust, for example, can just be a regular basic emotion. Like if I see a dead animal, I, I might retch and back away. And that's a good evolved response because I could get sick if I uh, touched it or something, right? But uh, disgust could also be a moral emotion. Maybe I would be disgusted like um, uh, over uh, something that somebody did. You know, if somebody wronged someone in, in a certain way, that could also disgust me, right? Or there's righteous anger too. Like I can be angry a anger may be, interestingly, one of the most moral emotions because it's about, it lets you know that something wrong has happened to you yeah, and you, that you need to correct it, you know? Like, yeah, like indignation would be like righteous anger. Like, like if I was angry on someone's behalf who had been wronged, right? And finally, emotions are also like a cognitive shortcut, you know? Yes, we have reason and consciousness and all that good stuff. But when we're out there in the world, the world is a dynamic place that's always changing. And sometimes it's changing too fast to stop and think. So what do you do? You go with your gut. And that's what, uh, that's kind of like an evolutionary explanation, possibly for things like intuition, which, I mean, incidentally, a lot of people think intuition is, um, you know, something spooky or magical. It's not. It's, uh, it's simply unconscious, unconscious judgment. And that can sometimes be emotionally charged. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the reason why we do this is because we don't always have the cognitive resources to dedicate toward thinking everything through like super rationally. So um, that's how I, as a naturalist, understand emotions. As far as understanding what it's like, you know, their phenomenology. Well, now we're getting close to some really difficult questions uh relating yeah, to conscious consciousness yeah basically. we're yeah exactly we're getting very close to that and and i i could go on and on ad infinitum about what i think of that but i better not mm -hmm. uh because i just i would never stop talking so <laughs> but yeah that's yeah. how i understand them yeah no because I, I mean i think i would i would largely agree with you and by no means want to discount evolution evolution seems to be very important and also quite true um, and I think, like like you said, like con the cognitive aspect of emotions is also very important. Like emotions are telling you something, and you know it's important that you recognize that and try to figure out what are they telling you and what to do with that. Um, and I think you gave like a good sort of summary of different reasons to 
why why you know we might have evolved emotions right and and i think that that's yeah i think that that's like those are all some compelling reasons i guess i guess it is basically just the hard problem of consciousness for me and and i'm not trying to say oh therefore a soul or what therefore immaterial soul or whatever I'm not trying to say anything like that i'm just saying like the question what is it like to be in love seems like a question both that should be able to be answered truthfully and that is just like if I ask you, what is it like to be in love? And you say, oh, what it's like to be in love is for certain chemicals to be released in your brain. Like my reaction is gonna be like, okay, haha. But really though. Well, I'm a naturalist, know? but I'm not a reductionist. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so like I would say that uh, if you're asking what is it like to be in love, I understand what you mean is the phenomenology. But I would counter by saying that I'm not sure that it's really, uh, there's a what or a that that it's like to be in love. It could be more of like a, how is it like being in love? And what I'm getting at there is kind of getting back to like Frank Jackson's old thought experiment about the knowledge argument um, against physicalism, which I disagree with. But one of the answers to that thought experiment uh, when Mary steps out of the room and sees color, if she's surprised is that, well, sure, she had all of the propositional knowledge about color, but not like practical know-how. That's one response. Um, but I would say, um, you know, there's, uh, the reason why emotions feel like they do, um, certainly supervenes on what's happening in the brain, but, uh, we do have yet to explain those fundamental, you know, sort of questions, right? Like, yeah, I, like I why, why is there healing? Why couldn't there just not be healing? Yeah, like, like, uh, yeah, like, or, or, or qualia, like, uh, people are like, uh, you know, uh, what, like, for me, the question is like, not that there are qualia, uh, but like, I, I can understand, like, okay, so this color is this wavelength of light and it affects my retina in a certain way and it affects my primary visual area in a certain way. But why is red red and not some other color? right like that's really where i i'm like oh, i really got to think about that some more uh so that's where i bump up against the hard problem so yeah i hope that answers your questions yeah no that was that was good uh yeah without going into sort of a long conversation about the hard problem of consciousness and what it what it means i mean if people are interested in consciousness uh, i'll just put this out there i that i am doing um it's a first year seminar, uh, but it's on consciousness and, and I'm going to be offering it in the fall and registration opens soon. So, uh, you know, I know I know a lot of the people in this class are probably not first years, but if there's room and you want to get in on this, um, it, this this is the kind of class where I would talk about that stuff uh, quite a lot. Um, so if anyone's interested, you may you may you may wish to know about this and, you know, re register if you like uh, the more the merrier. But anyway, wow, 450, huh? So what a good class. This was a fun one. I really like the discussion toward the end. I hope we get a lot of discussion going next time. So remember, please, uh, if you haven't uh, finished uh, Sandman, finish that, um, and then Freud, you can probably skim the first section of his essay. The, the, the second and third sections are where the, the real substance is at. Um, so please do that for Tuesday and, and I'll see you all then. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.